OK, now. Um, the lead in to this is that usually with with a function like this, this is a linear function, which means it's a straight line. Linear function. OK, I am going to be hello there. I'm going to be. Um, um, yes, right now writing the, the slope formula that you're familiar with. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. That's the formula we customarily use with linear functions like this. However, with curved functions like this, if we want to find out the rate of change, we use the difference quotient, and that gives us a formula for the average rate of change for any value of X. So I'm going to start out doing this with a linear function, even though please remember you would never go to this much trouble with a linear function. You would use the old familiar slope function. OK, but I'm going to use this just to show you how it works. There are steps you can follow, and if you do that, let me write graph here, graph. OK, um, and that's not what this looks like. This looks like a line that's rising to the right. OK, OK. Now, here are the steps that we'll use no matter what kind of function we have um, to find the, the, uh, the slope of a line at any particular value of x for whatever this function might be. But here we're just doing this. The answer should be 8 because eight is the slope of this line. This is y, this is the same thing as y equals eight x minus nine. So we already know what the answer is, okay? But here we go using the difference quotient. Step one. You want to find out what f of x plus h is. We're going to do that now. f of x plus h equals 8 times x plus h minus 9. What f of x plus h means is that in the x here, I put an x plus h. Now I'm just going to calculate what that is. f of x plus h equals, and I'm going to distribute and distribute, 8x plus 8h minus 9. And that's what f of x plus h is. That's not hard. Not when you're working on a linear function. Step two. Now that we know what f of x is, we're going to find out what f of x plus h minus f of x is. So I'll say f of x plus h minus f of x. Equals. Let's move this down a little bit so I know. Yes, OK. You can see it, right? I hope you can. We know that f of x plus h is 8x plus 8h minus 9, so 8x plus 8h minus 9, 
and then minus what f of x is. So f of x is 8x minus 9. Okay, I'm going to combine like terms, but first, I have to distribute this negative sign to the 8x and to the minus 9. Okay, so negative times positive 8x is minus 8x. And minus or negative times negative 9 or minus 9 is going to be plus 9. And then I write f of x plus h in front of it. And all we're going to do now is combine like terms. I have an 8x and a minus 8x. 8x minus 8x is zero. And negative nine or minus nine plus positive nine is also zero. So all I have left is eight times h. That's the only, um, here, let me erase this and put a littler circle around it. 8h eight eight is all that's left. So that is what f of x plus h minus f of x equals. Now, f of x plus h minus f of x, this is the entire numerator top of our fraction. So uh, step three, and this is the last step. I'm going to find f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. That is the difference quotient. f of x plus h minus f of x is 8h. And then I'm dividing that, which is that, by h. So I have 8h over h, and the h's cancel, leaving me with 8, which you already know is the slope of f of x plus h. No, no, f of x equals 8x minus 9, which is the same thing as y equals 8x minus 9, which is in y equals mx plus b form. So yes, when we have y equals on one side, we're going to and uh, we're going to be able to look at x, okay, on the other side and say that that's the slope. So since f of x plus h minus f of x over h is just the slope of a line drawn tangent to a curvy curve, a different kind of function, um, we can see that what we're going to be doing is finding the slope of that line actually we're going to be finding the slope of something very much like it. Suppose we have a line that goes through this point and this point. Well, OK, this is X1. I am not the great per, the greatest drawer of a straight line. But if that's X1 and that's X2, which means this is x1 and this is x2. What we're actually finding in this class is the slope of this line 
And you don't have to know it's called the secret line, but it is called the secret line. And the idea what you would do when you take calculus is you would be moving X1 and X2 so close to each other, they might as well be the same point. And then we actually have the slope or something very close to it of this line. But that takes the technique that you learn in calculus. Right now, we're finding the slope of the secant line. And that helps us find the average rate of change as this curve goes from X1 to X2, or to the point at X1 and the point at X2. So that's what we're doing. And eight is exactly the answer I should have come up with, since in this case, we're dealing with a straight line. Now we're going to ju uh, jump to problem number three, and you're going to see how this is really used. Problem number three, and for my benefit, I'm going to write the serial number so I can find it again, 5.4.41. And we are now going to be finding the difference quotient when f of x equals x squared plus 1. This is number 3 in your homework. Right here. Let's see. All right, guys. Oh, that's right. Never mind. Never mind. Um, I forgot that this is a completely different program from this. So I am just going to say to heck with it and come over here. X squared plus one. Now what this looks like is this. It's what we call a parabola. It's definitely not a straight line. But if I want to be able to find the slope of the secant line at two points that are preferably close together on this parabola, so I can find the average rate of change between these two points, then I'm going to have to use f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So let's do that with the three-step method after I take a drink of coffee. Okay. Step one. f of x plus h equals x plus h being squared, and then bring down the plus 1. This is what f of x plus h equals. Now, x plus h squared is going to be x plus h times itself. But I don't want to forget my plus one. So I write that down too. Now I am going to, I'm going to use the split and multiply method, but you can FOIL if you know FOIL. So taking the first term from the first set of parentheses, x times x plus h 
See, I'm splitting. Take the plus H. Multiply it by the second set of parentheses. And then I don't want to forget my plus one because that's an important part of this. Now that I've split, I'm going to multiply, which is distribution. X times X, X times plus H, plus H times X, plus H times plus H, and then plus one. So X squared plus H X, and I put the H in front of the X, for an important reason, I'll let you know in a minute. Oops. Oops. No paren needed. HX plus H squared plus one. H is a number. Usually it's a very, very small number but it can be anything you want it to be if you're the researcher who's using it or the engineer who's using it or whatever you may be in your career. So we usually put the number in front of X. That's why I put it in front of X. Would the world come to an end if I put H behind X? The answer is no. It wouldn't, but you want to make sure these two look alike because we're going to combine them. So I'll copy down my X squared. HX plus HX is two HX. Plus H squared. Plus one. And that is what f of x plus h equals. Notice that step one takes longer here than it did with just a straight line. Okay, step two. That's not step two. Step two. We are now going to find f of x plus h minus f of x. OK, well, f of x plus h is x squared plus 2hx plus h squared plus 1. x squared plus 2hx plus h squared plus 1 minus parentheses f of x which is x squared plus one. Okay, I'm going to distribute the minus sign. Minus times x squared is minus x squared. Minus times plus one is minus one. And I'll write down f of x plus h in front of it, and then we'll combine like terms. Okay. Well, my like terms are, and I think I'll make them a blue, x squared and minus x squared. And that's zero. 
and plus one and and minus one there's zero one minus one is zero and so let's look at what we have left let's use magenta for that i have two hx and I have h squared, and that's all I have left. So 2hx plus h squared. That's what f of x plus h minus f of x equals. Now step three, I now am going to calculate f of x plus h minus f of x. We already know the answer to that over h, which means we're going to take this and divide by h. So 2h x plus h squared. Now there is only one time you can cancel a common factor on a fraction. And that's when it is a common factor of either the top or the bottom or both. So notice that both of these terms have an h. In fact, h squared is h times h. So I'm going to pull this out because it's a common factor. It's a greatest common factor. That will leave me with 2x plus h over h. Now you can check you're factoring here by remultiplying h times 2h uh, h times 2x is 2hx and h times plus h is plus h squared so we did this correctly now now that i have h times what's in parentheses over H. Now I can cancel, cancel, cancel. And all I have left is 2X plus H. And that is what F of X plus, F of X plus H minus F of X all over H equals. Here's the gap between x1 and x2. That's what h equals. h equals gap between x1 and x2. OK, so. If we can move these close enough together so that they almost are equal. Then our H will be almost equal to zero. We can kind of say, all right, what if H were zero, then what would the, the what would the rate of change be? And then it would change to instantaneous rate of change. I'm just getting you ready for calculus. Those of you who plan to take it. And if you don't. Well, I think you should, because I think it's the most interesting class in the world. 
Let's do one more. This is a long one. This is number five in your homework. Which is 5445. 5.4.45. Okay. So f of x equals negative 10 x squared plus 3 x. No, plus, never mind, never mind. Ignore me. Everyone does. Oh, poor teacher. Okay. Oh, it is plus 3x. Never mind, I was looking at the answer. I wanted to make sure the answers were included here for you and for me, just so I could check myself. All right, so again, I was actually right. Negative 10 X squared plus 3 X plus 6. That is our F of X. And it also, ah, uh ah, -uh, no, it doesn't. It's what we call a cupped down parabola. Right there. OK, we're going to find the slope of the secant line drawn between two points, like maybe this point and this point. I'll never manage it. There is just no way that I. Well, I don't know. It's not too bad. Right there. Always do it this way because it's easier for me to draw from left to right. I'm right handed, but it's easier for me to draw from left to right. OK, here we go. Step one. I'm just going to call them out now. F of X plus H equals negative 10 times X plus h squared plus 3 times x plus h plus 6. That's what f of x plus h is in this case. Okay. Now I'm going to rewrite this so I have negative 10 times x plus h times x plus h. Then plus 3 times x plus 3 times plus h will give us plus 3x plus 3h. And then I have plus six. OK. Now. You could distribute this negative 10 in there and then multiply negative 10 X minus 10 H times X plus H. But I personally think it's better. To wait and multiply x plus h times x plus h, because after a while you memorize what it equals. Or maybe you know the formula. There is a formula. But x plus h plus x plus h, all, I mean times x plus h, when you multiply x plus h times x plus h, you get x squared plus 2hx plus h squared. And then plus 3x plus 3h plus 6. 
and then we start again. Moving from left to right, we're going to distribute negative 10 to x squared plus 2hx plus h squared, and that will give me negative 10x squared plus, yeah, well, plus. Well, no, let's wait. What? Rid of that little dot. Instead, I'm going to say negative 10 times plus 2hx is going to be minus 20hx. And then minus 10 times plus h squared is going to be minus 10h squared. And then write the rest of this plus 3x plus 3h plus 6. And there we have what f of x plus h equals. Negative 10x squared minus 20hx minus 28, uh, minus 10h squared plus 3x plus 3h plus 6. Okay, that was step one. We'll call it that here. Step one. And bigger, step one. Now we're going to go to step two. Which is to calculate, and I'm going to write it really big here, f of x plus h minus f of x. And the reason I'm doing this, of course, is I want to take what f of x plus h equals and move it down here. So negative 10x squared minus 20h x minus 10 h squared plus 3 x plus 3 h plus 6 Whew. minus parentheses what f of x equals negative 10 x squared plus 3x plus 6. And that's the raw form of what f of x plus h, which should be all of this. Yeah, I'm going over it making sure. Minus, and I have to put f of x in parentheses because it's being subtracted. And I have to be able to distribute the minus sign to every term in f of x. And when I do that, I get minus negative 10x squared, which will be plus 10x squared, minus plus 3x, which will be minus 3x, and minus plus 6, which will be minus 6. And then I write down all this stuff. Oh, negative 10x squared minus 20hx minus 10h squared plus 3x plus 3h plus six. Okay, now, I'm gonna mark this up. I immediately see that I have a plus six 
and a minus six. They are like terms. Six minus six is zero. So I'm gonna mark through them. And then I have a three X plus three X and a minus three X. And I'm gonna connect these. Now this kind of looks like a, um, a minus sign, so I'm gonna erase that, that and I'm gonna make it bigger to include the plus sign. Yep, 3x minus 3x is zero. And then I have one more set of similar terms, like terms, negative 10x squared and positive 10x squared. And because negative 10 plus positive 10 is zero, negative 10 X squared plus 10 X squared is going to be zero. And now, the only stuff left is, oh, that's too solid, isn't it? Oh, well, let's get rid of it. And I'll just underline it. Negative 20 HX minus 10 H squared plus 3 H. Those are the only terms left standing. Another sip of coffee. So F of X plus H. minus f of x, the top of the fraction is going to equal negative 20 hx minus 10 h squared plus 3 h. Notice again that we have an H in each of these terms. It's good to notice that. Now, step three that's where we find the difference quotient F of X plus H minus F of X over h equals negative 20 hx minus 10 h squared plus 3 h over h. And now, because I don't have room over here, I will come over here. And since each of these terms has an H, I will pull out an H greatest common factor. So H times negative 20 HX. Uh, 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 we already pulled out the H. So it's out front now. So this is just negative 20 X minus 10 H because H squared is H times H. We'll have H times H, okay? And then there's an H in the three, so it's pulled out there. And again, I can check my work by remultiplying H times ne negative 20 X, H times negative 10 H, H times H, and that will give us back. Uh-uh. See how easy it is when you're talking and writing at the same time to make mistakes. The H 
got pulled out front, so I'm left with that three right there. Thank goodness I looked over it again. All right, now all of that is just all of this. We now have to put it over H. And since we have H times this over H, we can cancel our H's. And everybody's happy now because we know what F of X plus H minus F of X over H, that is the difference quotient. We know what the difference quotient is for this f of x, f of x minus 10x squared plus 3x plus 6. This formula will let us find the slope of the secant line or the average rate of change for every x value in the graph. Yes, I'm just double checking to make sure my answer is correct. There you go. Now there is your answer to an admittedly more complicated and therefore longer problem. Almost a page. Don't write real small, write big. Go ahead and take up a page. Make sure you can do this. Hey, discussion. If not, we move on. It's hard to know what to ask at first. You know my email address. You can ask me questions any time. I have faith that we will not be stuck in snow and ice storms for the rest of the winter. However, I have discovered something of interest, and that is. On YouTube, there are independent meteorologists who have all the models to work with, like the European model, the Canadian model, the, um, I forget what the first letter is, but the last three letters are RRR. That's the high resolution, so I think the first letter is H, HRRR. That's the one that shows the most detail. Then there's the National Weather Service model, and there are a bunch of other models. And these independent meteorologists usually go over um, uh, what's coming, and they do a much better job than our weather channel, which seems to not, I mean, our meteorologists go on a model that only works like two days in advance. You want to be able to know a week or more. Actually, even the, the independent meteorologists say a weather weather prediction is not accurate in uh, uh, for more than a week. And even then. But they can get you ready. Now, let me tell you my favorite ones. Ryan Hall, y'all. What about Ryan? He's super. I watch him every time he makes a video and I follow him on Twitter. So I highly recommend Ryan, but I also watch every day Weatherman Plus. This is a down home Southern boy. 
who's actually not a boy anymore. Weatherman plus. But he actually works with more uh, models than than Ryan does. And he talks about other stuff. If you're interested in meteorology, he's even got charts about uh, changes in wind direction and wind she shear and upflow and downflow. And it's fabulously interesting listening to Weatherman Plus also. So I like both of them, but I actually joined Ryan Hall's uh, channel and his Twitter, Twitter station. And yeah, I love Ryan. He's very interesting. Is that OK? Do you agree? Yes, ma'am. OK, we both agree. So I recommend it. Everybody should be watching Ryan Hall, y'all. Now, here's our next group. Now, you don't need this. I know you almost everybody knows how to graph, but we have to go over this anyway. So what I'm going to do is give a full page here and make this really big. And we're just going to go over different models for graphing, like intercepts. It's incredibly important in college algebra that you know what intercepts are. Intercepts. They play a very, very important part in algebra. You got to know. One kind of intercept gives you your zero, and it's the zeros that actually build the polynomials. And we will talk about that at the end of the semester or maybe before. OK, but anyway. To work. Where's blue? I guess that'll do. Make it a little thicker, not a lot. OK. Now we have a line in what we call standard form. You would have to put this in slope intercept form if you were looking for the slope, but we're not looking for that. Instead, we're talking about graphing by knowing the intercepts. Here's the way you find the intercepts, and it's actually faster most of the time than using your calculator to do it. You make a little tic-tac-toe board. OK, now up here with zero under the X, we say, OK, well, I'm going to put a zero in for X, so I'll have plus 3Y minus 6 uh -uh, equals 6. 0 plus 3y equals 6, so 3y equals 6. Divide by 3, divide by 3. y equals 2. So if x is 0, y is 2. This is the first point I'm going to be plotting, and this is the y-intercept. intercept. Now down here, we're going to say, OK, what if y is 0? Then I'll have x plus 3 times 0 equals 6. 3 times 0 is 0. So we'll have x equals 6. And I put 6 in over here. So my next point is going to be 6, 0. And that is the x-intercept. Now, 
notice for the y-intercept, the x-coordinate is zero. For the x-intercept, the y-coordinate is zero. It's important which number is in which position. Let's go ahead and graph. Zero, two here on the y-axis, x equals zero. So I go up to y equals two and I make a point. And then for six zero, I start at the center. And I, since y is zero here on the x-axis, I'm going to plot a six there. Before I do anything else, let me write down this. On the x-axis, y equals zero. On the y-axis, x equals zero. And now all I have to do is try my best to draw a straight line, which for me is very difficult. All my lines are wavy. See, look at that, it's wavy, but what the heck, I'll put up with you making wavy lines too. It's only fair. Okay, you've done this now for a million billion years. But we will go on to graphing vertical and horizontal lines. The easiest way to do this is by hand because your graphing calculator will not do it for you unless you have a special little app called Inequals. And um, yeah, <clears throat> the calculator I use, Wabbit Emu, doesn't have it. So I have to do this the old way. When you see X equals one, and you're being asked to graph, that means you have to find two points. So I'm going to find an X, I'm going to make an X and a Y chart. Now here's what I do with it. X equals one means that X has to equal one, no matter what. So X is one here and one here. On the other hand, because there's no Y in this equation, the Y can be any numbers you want. 348.2, but I don't want that. I want an easy number for goodness sake. So how about Y equals zero and Y equals two? I can make those choices because there is no y up here, no y. So I can choose anything I want. All right, we're going to be asked to graph this. However, the first thing we're being asked is, what the heck is the slope? So we are not gonna use the difference quotient. We are going to use the slope formula. Okay, so I'm going to let one zero be x one, y one. And I'm going to let one two, you're kidding. One two, yeah, I, I came up with that all by myself. How about that? One two be x two and y two. For no other reason than this came first and this came second, you could rename them, but then you have to stick with your choice. So y2 minus y1, y2 minus y1, y2 minus y1 is going to be 
2 minus 0. And x2 minus x1 is going to be 1 minus 1. Oh no! You're not allowed to have a 0 on the bottom of a fraction. That means this fraction, <clears throat> which happens to be the slope, is undefined. So, always, the slope of a vertical line is not defined. because of the zero you get in the denominator. Now we're going to plot our points. We've got one zero and one two. And then we draw or attempt to draw, if you're me, a vertical line between them. Ugh. Okay. There we go. Good enough. This is the line whose name is x equals one. That's the um uh, the equation of this line. Vertical lines will all look like that x equals a number. Oh, there's another one. Ah, but here is the other kind of line, a horizontal line. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing, only now y has to be negative 2. And there is no x. So x can be any number we want it to be, like an easy number, like 0 and 1. How about that? 0 and 1. Now we're being asked to find the slope. Um, yeah, we are. Okay, zero negative two is x1, y1, and put it here, one comma negative two is going to be x2, y2. And m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And that is going to be negative 2 minus negative 2 over, yeah, y2 minus y1 right there, right there. And x2 minus x1 is going to be, yeah, I don't care. Okay. Is going to be one minus zero. Negative negative is a plus, so we're going to have negative two plus two over 1, which is going to be 0 over 1. And we do not have a crisis here because 0 divided by 1 is just 0. So the slope is 0 right there. All horizontal lines have a slope of 0 because the numerators will always be zero. So, 
Ah, uh, let me find these points now. Zero, negative two. And one, negative two. Ah, right. And we could find more points like two, negative two. Three, negative two. All the Y coordinates are going to be negative two. So what you get is a horizontal line. So this is the line Y equals negative two. All horizontal lines look basically the same. They have Y equals and then a number, and the number happens to be on the Y axis, a horizontal line going through this number right there. 